Well, hi, everybody. Greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Several of my subscribers asked me to have a look at this video by P-Brain, where he debunks the spinning ball Earth and uh, basically give them some of my thoughts on it. So I'm going to go ahead and go through this video and uh, just kind of review it a little bit. Why don't you all follow along with me? The Earth is said to be rotating once every 24 hours, and it's said to have a diameter of 8,000 miles and a radius of 4,000 miles, with a 25,000 mile circumference. That would give the Earth a rim velocity, or equatorial speed, of about 1,000 miles per hour. All right, I'm totally with you on that. Yes, the Earth does have a diameter of 8,000 miles. Yes, the radius is 4,000 miles. Yes, it rotates once a day. And since the circumference is 24,900 miles, roughly, that means that we do go through about 1,000 miles per hour of circumference, or about 15 degrees. So I'm with you right now, P-Brain. Everything looks fine so far. And that 1,000 mile per hour equatorial speed is said to be bulging the Earth 14 miles high and flattening the poles. Okay, many ball Earth advocates will straw man this. Right with this one rotation in 24 hours. They love to say, well, look at the hour hand on a clock. See how slow it moves? It barely moves at all. You don't even see it. And that's true. Right? And they say, do you think you'd feel that? And of course, you're stuck and you have to say, well, no. But what they're not telling you is a 4,000 mile long hour hand, at the tip of it, it would be moving at 1,000 miles per hour. Okay, and you're calling that a straw man argument. All right, well, first of all, I think P-Brain, you need to have a look and see what a straw man argument is. A straw man argument is when you take your opponent's position and exaggerate it to a unrecognizable degree, and then you argue against that exaggeration. What you've described so far is just actually a truthful depiction of the facts. So yes, the Earth's rotation is 15 degrees per hour. Yes, if that was an hour hand, it would move around the entire clock face on a 24-hour clock once a day, and that would be the speed of the rotation of the Earth. And if that hour hand was 4,000 miles long, yes, the tip of the hour hand would be moving at 1,000 miles an hour. These are all correct. Now, P-Brain, what you're failing to tell your viewers here is any concept of relative motion. Okay, so while you are correct that if you are on this hour hand moving around the 24 hour clock face once a day and that hour hand was 4,000 miles long, yes, the tip of that hour hand would be moving at 1,000 miles per hour. Absolutely correct. However, if you were standing on the tip of that hour hand, you too would be moving at 1,000 miles an hour, as would all of the air around you. So, relative to the tip of the hour hand there, you will not be moving at all. Either will the air, either will the hour hand. So even though it's physically moving in space, you don't notice that it's moving in any way, shape, or form. That's called relative frame of reference. And would you feel that? Well, let's just say the ground feels it. The Earth is said to be squashing at the poles about 14 miles on each pole and bulging up at the equator 14 miles high, right? Gazillions and gazillions of tons of rock and dirt and water. So would we feel it? Um, well, actually, I'm going to surprise you and I'm going to say no, because we'd all be dead. Well, you know, that's a very dramatic statement to make. And, you know, I mean, it just puts so many visuals in our head there, P-Brain, except for a couple of minor little problems. First, the people that live in the equatorial regions are not dead. And second, the Earth does bulge 14 miles at the equator. So how can we explain this? Well, I know how we can explain it. I can see here very clearly that you do not understand it at all. Now, in order to understand this, you have to actually understand the amount of force involved here. Uh, you seem to think that this is some sort of a huge dramatic force. In reality, it is not. This is a 14-mile bulge on an 8,000-mile diameter sphere. Uh, 
Uh, if you look at objects that are at the equator versus objects that are at the poles, the ones at the equator weigh about three-tenths of a percent less than the ones at the, uh, at the poles. You have to actually get instrumentation out to even be able to detect it. So it is not a cataclysmic event, uh, this 14-mile bulge at the equator. And another thing about this straw manning tactic, the scientists who came up with the equatorial bulge did not use the one rotation in 24 hours as their criteria for coming up with this theory of the squashing of the poles in the equatorial bulge, obviously. They knew that the 1,000-mile-per-hour rim speed would create such a disfigurement of the Earth. And so they came up with the flattening of the poles and the bulging of the equator 14 miles, based on the rim speed or the rotational speed, not on the rotational period of 24 hours. All right, I'm going to have to sit down and unpack this a little bit because I'm having some difficulty understanding your logic here. Now, you are saying that the people, quote-unquote, scientists that came up with this idea, as you're putting it, that the Earth is bulging 14 miles at the equator, did not take into account the rotation of the Earth. All they did was look at the linear speed of the Earth at the equator. Well, I've just got a couple of quick questions for you. First of all, how did they figure out that linear speed? Did they do it by looking up at the stars and looking at angular changes up there? You know, how did they come up with it? Now, if I was a betting man, I would bet that they sat down and said, well, the circumference of the Earth is 24,900 miles. It rotates once a day. That means that it rotates just over 1,000 miles per hour because there are 24 hours in a day at the equator. And depending on what they needed to put into the equation to try and figure out what the expected bulge at the equator would be, they could put in the angular speed, they could put in the linear speed, yet they would all come up with the same answer, wouldn't they? So your idea that it only works if you put a linear speed of a thousand miles an hour into the equation is ludicrous. It's, it's, it's a failure of middle school level mathematics. There are a number of ways that we can calculate this bulge. We can measure it directly uh, by checking distances uh, along the equator by lines of longitude. I mean, we can use any of the numbers that we want. They all come up to the exact same answer. So here's the problem. If the Earth has a 14-mile high bulge and is flattening at the poles, everything would spin off. See, the bulge itself indicates that everything wants to fly off, as I showed with the spinning ball and the spinning balloon. Okay, we'll have a look at those in a minute. But as I've clearly demonstrated already, if you have a 4,000-mile-hour hand that moves around the face of a 24-hour clock once a day, yes, the tip of that hour hand is moving at 1,000 miles an hour. So are you. So is the air around it. So with from your frame of reference, standing on the tip of the hour hand, nothing's moving. Now, you seem to be a little baffled as to how we could possibly have still water at the equator. Why on earth wouldn't we? It is still relative to the earth under it and the air over it. It just sits there. And that's what still water is. It's water that's just sitting there. The supposed bulge is currently tied to the rotational speed. Here's what Wikipedia says. An equatorial bulge is due to the force exerted by its rotation. And it says the Earth is ductile, which means malleable, right? It's flexible. The Earth's equatorial bulge has been decreasing in step. There's the key, in step, with the decrease in the rate of rotation. So for all those ball earth defenders that like to say, oh, the bulge is an artifact of when the earth came into being. It was molten, kind of like uh, some fresh wet concrete, and it has since hardened into the bulge. Well, that's absolutely false compared to what uh, Wikipedia and science says. It says that it's the bulge is tied, inextricably linked to the rotational speed. So stop saying that. Okay, now this is actually kind of an interesting point that he's making right now, uh, which, you know, of course, destroys his entire argument that this is some sort of a cataclysmic event. Okay, this is a good example of P-Brain 
demonstrating his complete misunderstanding of this. First of all, the argument is not that the bulge occurred due to a one-time event when the Earth was young and semi-molten. So the mantle is the layer of the Earth that is between the outer core and the crust. Now, the mantle consists of hot rock that has a putty-like consistency. It is indeed ductile and malleable, as B-Brain points out. Yet, he seems to not be able to make the connection that if you have basically a large ball of putty that is slowly rotating once every 24 hours, that that putty will bulge out a little bit. Now, the fact that the Earth's rotation is slowing down very slightly does indeed affect the equatorial bulge. Now, how much is the Earth's rotation actually slowing down? Since 1972, we've had to add 37 leap seconds to make our timepieces all stay in, in sync. So we're looking at a slowing of the Earth's rotation of approximately 37 seconds since 1972. So, will this have an effect on the equatorial bulge? Yes. Will it have a significant effect on it? Something that we can detect without the use of instruments? No. All right, and what I'm going to show in this video is that the bulge cannot be going on underneath us and without us being affected here at the surface. Okay, here I have a spinning balloon and I have a spinning rubber ball. The water balloon's filled with water. Now, I know a lot of people are going to say, they're going to say, oh, but this is doing a much higher rotations per minute or RPMs, right? The Earth is one rotation in 24 hours. So I'm using the water balloon, even though it's got a higher spin rate, right? Even though it has a higher spin period than the Earth, but I cannot replicate the Earth. Nobody can. You'd have to make a ball as big as the Earth. Okay, this is a very good example of P-Brain's lack of comprehension and understanding of the forces involved in this rotational bulging. On the left, you see a balloon that he is rotating not once a day, but many times a second. And you're getting a very significant bulge out of it. Now, if you look at a balloon that is 8 inches in diameter, the bulge on the Earth represented on that 8-inch balloon would be 14 one-thousandths of an inch Likewise, on the rubber ball uh, on the right, he's spinning it at a high rate of speed and only accounting for the rotational force on the object. What he fails to include in both of these examples are the forces drawing objects on the surface within the Earth, and that force specifically is gravity. If you look at the amount of force driving water off of that rubber ball on the right, that would be countered by gravity. Now, on Earth, objects on the equator weigh less than objects on the poles. How much less, do you ask? Approximately three-tenths of one percent less. So, the force of gravity is considerably larger than the force trying to fling water and oceans and people off of the equator. That is almost uh, an insignificant, but clearly measurable with instrumentation, force. This is the crux of the video. This is the proof that we are not spinning. Uh, I know someone also is going to say to me, yeah, but the Earth's gravity regulates the water, keeps it from flying off. It, it keeps us in equilibrium, they like to say. Well, where in pray tell do you think I'm doing this experiment right now? I'll give you a hint. I'm outside, standing on the Earth. So the water is flying upwards against the Earth's gravity. The same gravity that's supposed to keep the water <laughs> calm as glass mirrors in these lakes. Once again, you're creating a situation that does not result in a calm lake like this. Now, if the Earth was spinning at the same rate of speed as your ball and your balloon, certainly you would be overcoming gravity. However, the force of that spin countering gravity, as I said earlier, is three-tenths of one percent. The fact that you can spin a rubber ball at a very high rate of speed and manage to spray up water really has nothing to do with whether or not this beautiful lake is nice and calm and mirror-like. And if you don't have this water flying off, and you have this placid water, 
then the earth is not spinning. Or you simply don't understand what is going on because you can't wrap your head around it. And I suspect the latter is the case. And another one I get is like, who do you think you are taking on the most brilliant minds that ever lived? I disagree. Maybe they weren't the most brilliant minds. Maybe they were the most brilliant deceivers. Maybe they were the best con men. They've presented a fairy tale for adults. That's what this is. I think that this is worth mentioning. So we have the hero here taking on all of these brilliant minds. But the thing that I notice here is that many of these brilliant minds are using compasses, 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 and compasses. And he seems to feel that this means that they are somehow all Freemasons rather than people simply using the tools of their trade. Now, some of them may have been Freemasons. Some of them may have been Catholic. Some of them may have been Jewish. What does that matter? Attacking somebody based on the fact that they use a compass, which suggests that they could possibly be a Freemason, does not invalidate their ideas. Every one of the gentlemen on this page have got theories out that have withstood peer review. They've withstood being replicated. They are used to predict reality. And their predictions match reality. That leads me to believe that they are what is called scientific theories. Scientific theories are very different than a standard run-of-the-mill theory. A theory in common usage is an idea. A scientific theory is a validated hypothesis that is the closest thing science has to a law or a truth. Simply trying to say that these people are all Freemasons and therefore we should disregard everything they say is foolish. Now, anybody with any intellectual honesty has to admit this. Anybody with any intellectual honesty would understand that you are completely misrepresenting the problem. The Earth has a gravitational force pulling things towards the center of the Earth. It does rotate once every 24 hours, and that causes a little bit of force pulling things away from the Earth. That force accounts for approximately three-tenths of a percent of the force of gravity pulling it in. Furthermore, the Earth is a sphere which bulges very slightly at the equator. Again, if the Earth was an 8-inch ball, the bulge would be 14 one-thousandths of an inch. And your efforts to try and put this into the category of some sort of a cataclysm are just simply unfounded. If you wish to translate a 1,000 miles per hour linear speed on the equator of the Earth, which has a diameter of 8,000 miles. So, for example, if the balloon and the ball were 8 inches in diameter, you would have to spin that at a speed that would allow 1 inch to go by every hour, yet you are spinning at multiple times a second. This has to do with just basically your lack of understanding of how to even set the problem up, much less understand what's going on or try and simulate it and use that simulation to try and debunk reality. It's not because people are questioning the equatorial bulge and the spin of the earth. I think it has to do more with people not having the basic understanding of motion, of rotational forces, of rotational velocity versus linear speed, of scale, of gravity, of the basic natural sciences that determine how our Earth operates. And that's actually kind of sad. And that is one of the reasons I do these videos, to try and increase the understanding of the general population of basic science. This is a very good example of that lack of understanding of basic science. This rabbit hole's too deep for me.